Everybody, please put your hands together for a virtual round of applause for the wonderful Alison. Alison, please take it away. Thank you very much. So, um, as Sarah said, you know, good morning, everybody. I'm Alison George, and I'm also the head of programmes and initiatives at a at an institution that's called the Development Partner Institute. So. Really, um, if I just explain a little bit about that, because that's the vein in which I got here, it's um, an organisation that exists to accelerate mining for development. It was set up by two people, Mark Katafani and um, Peter Bryant, to really think about new ways of doing mining, creating mining solutions, and to experiment with really sometimes difficult conversations that can propel the industry forward in a way that um, links with communities and different marginalized groups and does things in a different way. But I'm going to speak today just for 10 minutes and then um, have questions and answers because I've had a long journey in the uh, extractive and mining sector for 20 years. And there are a couple of things that I've picked up about trust and indeed equity along the way. And I'll speak for the second half about the work that we do at DPI too and what I bring to that um, from my experience. So the question of trust, I really felt um, to look at it another day, another way, um, which is what happens when trust is actually broken. And I've worked in fragile states um, and I've worked um, with organizations, whether it's multilaterals or bilaterals, um, competing against one another for political space. And indeed, the mining industry has many um, political faces as well. Um, so I think that. When I look at my experience, um, I started off with something called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative in 2001 and created the core of that. And it's now today a global standard. But I think that values underpins a lot of um, what we're talking about when we think about trust. So if you're building on broken promises or lack of respect for one another or um basically trauma. Some societies are traumatized by others historically. Um, lack of inclusivity in decision making, um, repackaging, reselling new ideas or words not supporting behaviors or constantly putting you know, interests above one another. Those are the things that are present when trust is absent. And I think that um, when I think about how we build trust, I've always as a sustainability professional or as an individual tried to create that in the projects or the uh, relationships or the conversations or the collaborations that um, we work on and build. I feel that um, there are, that the way that the world um, with geopolitics and um, lots of things is shaping today, trust is indeed a really big part of that. And I see that there are lots of organizations and lots of um, individuals and lots of people trying to figure out what this means. And I think there's really good lessons learned um, when you stand on authenticity. Um, I think that for us at DPI, if I can just speak there, um, we have three flagship programs. And um, I think about those things that I mentioned at the start being absent when we're trying to create um, programs that actually stand the test of time. Um, so we're in the business of creating trust amongst investors, mining companies, communities, um, between different types of um, countries where there's an experience of perhaps colonization and um, those experiences, the development agenda, um, and with different governments, bringing different governments to the table. And I feel that one of the ways that DPI, for example, plays a big part is that there's sometimes trust broken. I've come from the multilateral and bilateral experience. And um, I think there is a space for a new type of development facilitator um, on, uh, on the scene. So where you see um, geopolitics and sometimes some Southern hemisphere countries not wanting to fully participate and work with some other um, countries, I feel that there is um, organizations like DPI that provide a neutral platform or provide honest conversations is really um, invigorating for lots of different people, especially where you have a lot of the private sector mining, deep, with deep mining experience, trying to figure out what are the solutions and the way forward, um, especially for the energy transition. Um, 
So with DPI, I'll just speak about some of the things that we do. So we have a flagship project, um, which is known as the Responsible Sourcing Coalition, RESCO, and you have responsible sourcing in lots of different ways. But essentially, what does that mean? Um, what we've taken it to mean is we developed a five phased program. And at the very start of that, we saw that there's trust that's been broken with, I think, the younger generation on a global level in many ways. And um, what we have tried to do is to understand the perspectives of that younger generation, in particular, um, people, young people from mining jurisdictions across South America, across Africa, across um, and in Australia as well. We asked them, we posed the question, the future is X. So we know that we have all these targets for 2050 with the energy transition. Um, we know that there's a lot of anxiety and broken trust and, and feeling and sentiment around what um, is being left behind as a legacy. So without being necessarily a technocrat or an expert, or what do you feel that responsible mining or responsible sourcing looks like to you? So we, you know, surf the globe to understand these different perspectives, and then we've put them into what we're using as our um, guidance for responsible sourcing and mining. And we had some really in-depth uh, perspectives and we could see some differences. So some people thought environment was at the top of the agenda. Other people put development at the top of the agenda. Other people from different um, jurisdictions felt that, you know, why do I need to fly to Switzerland to get responsible gold? This is, I exist in a mining country. Um, I'd like to see mining develop in my region. So all of these things were really with the vein of building trust and indeed equity and understanding um, different perspectives. We tried not to be uh, condescending and think, well, you know, what do you know about the energy transition? What do you know about this? Because people have a stake because they're going to be part of that. So we had lots of views um, from Peru, Bolivia, Tanzania, um, Zambia, as well as um, Australia. So different perspectives um, brought to the fore by young people and their ideas on the environment and their ideas about artisanal mining, where some people thought um, in certain jurisdictions we should ramp that up as opposed to having um, large scale miners that had historically you know, perceived to have done X, Y and Z. So it was really good. And we use that as a foundation and guidance. So we feel um, really promising that you know, young people were able to share their views um, and indeed create trust with organizations like ourselves. And we also had indigenous um, people as part of that, um, for want of a better term, people who rest on their land um, and also um, different suppliers and um, engineers. So bringing different people together and, and being really honest about conversations. One of the strengths of RESCO is that, that, that it deals with not just the future as X defining possibility, but it also has um, a focus on structural inequality across the value chain. So it calls out things that cr would create seismic shifts. So I talked earlier about when trust is absent. So repackaging and selling things in a different vein. So we call out, we talk about race, we talk about gender, um, we talk about um, indigenous communities in a way that is not uh, trying to, in, in a way that's trying to be raw, if I can put it that way. Um, the other thing that we work on to build trust, and I think when I look at what's absent, again, bringing in, um, is something called the Mining Innovation and Research Battlefield, which we run each year um, at the mining in Darba. We had the inaugural battlefield in 2022. And again, this looks at young people, but it also tries to focus on bridging the gap with researchers and miners and different institutions. We want people to submit bids for this competition that wouldn't normally work together. And you are prioritized for that. Um, so you could be a university working with an artisanal miner, working with a processor. So, you know, we want something different that's not been done before. We Let the cyborg continue a little bit. So that again. So I'm hoping that Alison will be able to catch up with us in a second. I you think know, is a way normally work together and creating. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can, we can hear you. We lost you for a little bit, but you're back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you all froze. Um, yeah, so that was just the innovation research battlefield, you know, bridging the gap between industry researchers and young people. So that's another thing um, that, you know, very passionate about, because when you see people, um, if you imagine Dragon's Den pitching on the stage together and being interrogated and feeling again as if they have a stake in um, the world that's to come or present day. Um, the other thing that we work on, and, and I think about, again, where trust uh, is broken, promises, lack of respect or trauma of society where can be absent. So bringing, um, you know, working with countries to redefine, redevelop, reconfigure the way that they do mining. And so sometimes we have what's termed as country catalysts. And our most recent work is in Zambia, um, working in the Northwest region that connects Angola and DRC. So it's been a series of conversations and um, again, bringing together different types of people and working with the spirit of collaboration to create a pilot where you wouldn't attribute it to one mining company or one supplier or one government department, but everybody working together to create a project for that region that cre creates socioeconomic um, benefits, that um, enhances agriculture, that looks at linkages across the supply chain. So that's what we're currently working on as well. And as I said before, so bringing myself into it is, you know, this understanding of what can be missing with my experience of fragile states and conflict and um, with different multilaterals, bilaterals, different governments, what's missing and then you, using that to infuse into the programs we have at DPI. And, and I feel also that values, as I said at the start, underpins it because it's interesting this term sustainability or responsible because I think from the early days in 2000 when I started this journey, it, it was always strange to me that people would design projects that didn't consider um, a community or different types of people or different arrangements. And I see lots of um, shifting to create those now, but um, I would say that it's something that has always underpinned the way that um, I've believed to, um, that I should work. And, and that's what I bring to my day job as well. Thank Fantastic. You Thank you so much for that insight and that overview, Alison. Round of applause. Um, I, I have a number of questions that I have scribbled down here, but again, to our other speakers, if you have questions, wave at me, as well as to our fantastic attendees either here in Zoom or, of course, those of you who are listening in on YouTube. So, Alison, just starting off with, with the work that you've been doing, listening to what do young people around the world actually want, did you get any really surprising answers or was it? all kinds of stuff that you were expecting to hear? Um, it definitely wasn't all kinds of stuff that I was expecting <laughs> to hear. I think that um, the, um, the, I don't know if I could say the personality shifted in the industry a little bit. Um, so you would hear young engineers talking about, um, you know, the way that they want to work with communities from the get-go, from the very beginning, and how they um, factor that into the way they do everything. And I think that over a 20-year span, that's a complete shift, you know, mm -hmm. to hear a young person, a young entry coming in, and also to then hear their ideas about um, bringing different types of people into the sector and the outreach that they're doing in their personal day-to-day -day job. So I felt what was, I guess, it wasn't surprising, but it was I definitely felt very positive about it and very energetic. So there's a lot of doom and gloom when we think about responsible sourcing, the fact that you think everybody's been irresponsible and it's just chaos. So when you hear young people and not, um, you know, so yeah, that that was very good to hear what they're, they're doing. I think also um, the idea that this collaboration with the artisanal um, medium scale and large scale miners, especially in the uh, South America. Um, so just hearing that they think, well, these things should come together or these things should just exist without the large scale. So it was very interesting um, to me to hear that. And also very much the focus on development. So I think in Australia, there was a little bit of difference where um, young people were very much concerned with the environment in a way that we would see here in Sarah, um, in the UK, Sarah, um, and in maybe Africa and South America, that wasn't necessarily the case. The case was that 
people felt that they'd lived in um lived with the land in in ways that were not um disturbing and would continue to do so but that also development was was key so arguably those um represent some of the things we see at a global level in conversations as well um but yeah i think the the key thing for me was the energy that they had because if you just pay attention to the news and some of the technocrats and you just feel a lot of doom or gloom so it was really <laughs> exciting to hear that people want to take control and be responsible in the world that's to come great now you mentioned the word collaboration in there and of course we've been hearing from people who've got fantastic projects all over the place at the moment so a question to you which is one that we've been thinking about a lot within responsible raw materials how do you collaborate with all the other groups that are doing similar projects to yourselves have you got any hints or tips with regards to that <laughs> I think that's an excellent question because um, sometimes I would say that there's when I talked about repackaging and selling afterwards. So sometimes you can miss the mark with um, lots and lots of different talking shops and forums and and everything else. I think it's important to have this kind of um, thing that we're having now, sir. I think that's a really good platform because then you get to see what other people are doing. Um, and then you get to learn and hear and think, right, this aligns with um, what, what I'm trying to achieve. So I think it's constant conversation um, and then aligning yourself with like minded people and sometimes doing projects together. Um, I think that um, when I look at, again, the, the discussion on trust, even working in a multilateral and bilateral space um, with some of the agencies, there can often be. Um, you know, you can see this with mining companies as well. People want to attribute this to me, me, me. Um, you know, all those narcissistic tendencies that we see in individuals across organizations or with organizations themselves. So I think it's constantly opening up, having these types of platforms, thinking about projects that we can do together and sitting down at the table and creating those. Because I think for the, um, the it, it's not only about pooling resources, but it's also about bringing in lots of ideas to the table and then reconfiguring something to, you know, create a better target, a better hit of what we're trying to achieve. And so we've done that a little bit. I think with um, DPI, we get different mining companies to come to the table and maybe sometimes quite uncomfortably for them because there's a vulnerable space. But to set you create this project together for this region in Zambia, because it's to all our interests. If things are operating in this way, there's infrastructure, you know, in place, there's um, you can have one supplier giving you X, Y, Z. So, again, it, it really is about um, those kind of things in a tangible form after the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Alison. Um, unfortunately, our time is up, so we need to move across to Jamie next. But everybody, round of applause for the fabulous Alison George. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.